Welcome to an episode of the Programmatic Digest podcast. I am Ellen Parker, your host, and on today's podcast, we have Hayley. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. How are you? I am very fantastic because I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're going to talk about some strategy around CTV OTT, but we're also going to redefine what it takes to do traditional TV versus digital or programmatic TV, I should say. And so you're here, you're the expert on that end. But before we start on this conversation, how about we take a few minutes to, def- um, to define, wow, to introduce yourself, like who you are, what you do, what scale marketing and more. So tell us about awesome. you. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Haley Wise. I am the group director of digital at Scale Marketing, which is an independent agency based in Chicago. We are a full service agency, so everything from data to creative, traditional media buying, and of course, digital. Uh, we like to say we are not um, in like one in, like, per, specialize in one industry, um, but we do specialize in our process and how we really lean into our clients' businesses. Yeah. Um, so my my day to day role really is to oversee the digital team and our practices, um, help build out client strategy and test different tech partners, evolve our audience strategy and things like that, and really bring a lot of innovation to our clients' media strategies. Right, 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 right. And I like what you'd said about it, is because I think um, I think it's it's a misconception about what the difference between an associate director, a director, and a group director. And I think you just hone in very well. And so if you really had to explain, like, let's say traditional media and programmatic media to like a five-year-old, what would you say to them? Like, how would you define the differences between programmatic uh, and traditional to a five-year-old, but also in a sense of what you do on your day-to-day? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I have never been a traditional expert, but I've learned a lot at my time in scale. Um, And so on the traditional side, you know, it's really when you turn on the television and um, see ads during like a football game, maybe if you're a five-year-old watching with your dad or mom or something like that, or when you're in the car and you hear those interruptions to your favorite song, like the uh, commercials and things like that. On the programmatic side, um, hard to explain to a five-year-old, but, you know, everything is a lot more fast-paced, um, a lot more automated, targeted, things like that. Um, I like to say, I try to explain it to my dad, too, <laughs> instead of a five-year-old, uh, right, right. making sure that we are hitting you instead of, you know, like everyone and things like that. Um, so we can really refine our media mix. Um, but what we have found at scale is that um, everything complements one another and works better together. So it's not traditional or digital. It's how do we how do we elevate and use both of these mediums together um, to really, you know, have that mass mass reach and kind of cover the market, but then also refine and t- hyper target the individuals that we're trying to go after for our clients' business. I like how you switch it to like I'm going to tell it to my dad and not to yeah. Father. <laughs> you know that's that's kind of like also a challenge so I'll definitely ask that question next time too like if you want to define your five-year-old define it to your grandparents or your <laughs> parents um the non-digital they have to be non-digital obviously yeah. but um okay well I think it's a great segue into today's conversation so a big thing of what you said was you know when we first talked about it um I was super impressed I was super I love first I loved your energy but also like I was super impressed about how you guys were able to sh- use traditional media to your advantage and then mix it in with some programmatic and use what you learn in traditional to implement programmatic plus some. So let's talk about the differences. First, let's talk about like the differences between traditional and programmatic for my friends that are maybe starting in the industry that are not ex- particularly clear on the differences and what that required. Like define the two for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we're talking about traditional, um, that is going to be anything that's viewed over the air or satellite or cable. Um, So really like not to use the word in explanation, but the traditional means of viewing. Um, When we talk about connected TV or OTT, so that really refers to anything that is being streamed. Um, So OTT is kind of, I like to say that umbrella term. Um, So that is just referring to the content that is delivered via the internet. Um, and then CTV is a form of OTT. So it is the actual um, hardware. It's the smart TVs. It's the connected devices like Roku and things like that, that allow us to stream our favorite television shows and movies and things like that. Mm, okay. Okay. So 
how can why would the brand do both or one or the other uh so we have brands who do you know they lean all the way into tr traditional we have brands who are leveraging both traditional and connected tv and then we have some brands that are only running connected tv um what we have found is no no two brands are the same no two plan no two plans are the same you uh, mean not a one size fits all no, definitely what? not it's crazy i know same. um but we have a lot of brands that heavily rely on traditional medium so they have their core customer is 35 plus and really more of that 45 plus target demo mm -hmm. and so the older demographic is still really leaned into traditional mediums. They might be adopting to, you know, the streaming platforms and things like that. And they like to go onto Hulu for a certain show, maybe. Um, but they're still leaned into the traditional mediums and you, they can be reached on both. Uh, so we try to figure out how to complement one another. And so whether that is using our connected TV dollars to really hyper target the young younger demo base for them. Um, like we know that 45 plus is probably covered with traditional. We can reach them with cheaper CPMs. Yeah. Uh, how do we use connected TV that is hyper targeted and does come at that more expensive CPM to really hone in and build up that younger demographic that'll eventually turn into their core customer at one point. Right. Um, we have some clients where their, their demo still is just really leaned into the traditional environment and they're hard to reach on connected TV still. So we'll still test it and we'll still, you know, we'll use it for linear suppression, let's say. So like, it's kind of like a safety net of anyone who wasn't exposed on linear, we can reach them on connected TV with ACR data and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have some clients who targeting really, really matters and traditional just doesn't make sense. The network CPMs are way too high for mm -hmm the amount of waste that we're going to get um, by running untargeted. And so those clients, we really lean into the CTV world of, you know, using that one-to-one -one targeting, making sure that we are not running wasted impressions and we're, right, we're right. really getting the most out of every dollar. So um, just to take one step back to the point you made on ACR data, like from operational perspective, what does that look like? Like first refresh our memory on ACR yeah uh, data what that is and why it's important to understand it but also like from an operational perspective if a trader or buyer anybody's in a dsp if that's involved what does it look like how do you implement that mm -hmm. yeah so acr is really i would say a great tactic and tool for a lot of reasons um acr stands for automatic content recognition um and it is something that is built into um typically the oem so original equipment manufacturer. And so that is, think about that as like your TV hardware. So Samsung, LG, Vizio, the actual devices in your living room, um, mm -hmm. Roku as well. So all the like streaming sticks and things like that, they have, some of them have ACR as well. And so what it does, it uses fingerprint, fingerprinting technology to pick up on what is actually being viewed on the glass itself. And so what we're able to do is um, if someone saw one of our clients ads through a cable channel, mm -hmm. um, because we send those partners our creative um, that's running, they're able to actually pick up on the brand and the creative and either suppress it. Um, so anything that we run on the streaming side, um, we will basically be suppressing those households that were exposed to a linear ad. Oh, or, wow. you know, there's sometimes like where you can conquest um, competitors and things like that, or do sequential messaging from your linear ad exposure to your streaming ad exposure. So if it's almost like a sequential messaging, like a retargeting play, something like that. Um, oh. We've tested a few of these different methodologies, whether it's from suppression to conquesting. Um, again, it doesn't like not one size fits all, but we have tested these um different strategies and we've really found some effectiveness in it especially from the conquesting play and i love the sequential the sequential the, the sequential creative strategy and for my friends who don't know what that means it's like when a client i mean when a client when a consumer watches creative one about what is I don't know what is programmatic and then the message they can be served with message two, right? Why is programmatic more important? And mm -hmm. a message three would be like how to learn programmatic uh, advertising or something like that. Yeah. So that was sequential. So the beauty of that, and I'm thinking why it's such a success is because now we step away from creative fatigue, right? There's this term that used to be used back in the days, at least 
where we refer to creative fatigue, which is if you haven't changed your uh, creative in a minute, it could look like a month, a quarter. Unfortunately, some creative be out there for a long time, mm -hmm. way too long. Um, it can create some type of fatigue. And the best example for you, and I can close this, this, the small loop with this, is that on LinkedIn, I scroll down on those sponsored ads. And of course, LinkedIn can be arguably, whether it's programmatic or not, always it's social media. Um, but on LinkedIn, I'm always seeing the same damn ads on LinkedIn. And I'm like, why am I still saying this? Like, I this is not even relevant to me, but I have this particular agency, right? That I follow. It's been the same message all freaking year, like all year. Mm -hmm. Like when I say all year, that's 12 months of that, that person. I am seeing the same creative. You know how annoying it is? There's some cases where bad PR is not always good PR. Like, eh, like any PR is not always like good PR, right? It's like, no, no, no. Sometimes it's just bad. Don't do it. <laughs> So with that said, to lead into the next point is that you also refer to OEM, which mm -hmm. I'm going to be, I'm going to tell my, I'm going to tell my truth right now. I know some of y'all are going to giggle like, like Haley's doing, but when she mentioned OEM, I thought she was talking about open exchange marketplace. If you, if you are hurt me, just DM me and let me know I'm not alone, but it isn't. It isn't. And so um, I think, I think, so what is OEM again? Because you said it at least twice to me and it's still not original, right. original equipment manufacturer. Okay. Like the Vizio, the LG. And wait, that used to be called something else though. OEM. It wasn't called OEM before. When was it called? Um, oh, anyway, it's going to come back to me, but anyway. Okay. So let's move into based on that. Mm -hmm. Let's move into the conversation of what is considered premium content nowadays. What is considered not premium content content, excuse me. Is that worth it? I mean, in our intro meeting, I mentioned the differences between open exchange, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I thought it was very yeah. open exchange marketplace versus like pre um, private marketplace for CTV specifically. So like, what's your take on, how do you define like, oh, this is premium content. I'm going to pay premium prices for this and I know it's going to perform. Like what's yeah. your take on that or the definition? Yeah, I would say it's probably defined slightly different by mm -hmm. everyone, um, especially to the viewer, what they what, what they define yeah. as premium and what they're willing to pay. Um, but, you know, we define it as anything that's not going to be a fast channel. Um, mm -hmm. So we're talking like, if you're leaning into Hulu, Peacock, um, if you're watching live sports, that kind of thing. So of course, those, those partners and that type of content does come with that premium price point. Um, and what we have found is that you, you can't run everything there. Um, it's just not going to work. You're not going to have enough reach. You're not going to have enough impressions in market unless you have, you know, all the budget in the world, yeah. uh, which, you know, would be nice as a marketer, but that's, not the, that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but so it is really finding the right mix between that premium content and leaning yeah. into like when live sports are happening or, you know, um, cultural moments and things like that. Yeah. And the shows that people are watching on Hulu and Peacock and Paramount, um, but also mixing in, in, in with that OEM, um, inventory, we have found a lot of great success with almost manufacturing mass reach, um, is like kind of how we've like, like to be talking about it. Uh, with our OEM partners. And so there's a lot of deduplication across them. And so you're able to really stitch together, you know, um, several different buys, um, whether it's a PMP, PG deal, going direct um, with these okay. different partners. Okay. And really using the force of both of them. So having this mix of, you know, the fast owned and operated channels from the OEM partners, that really is kind of like a linear-esque viewing. Yeah. And then also complementing that with the premium CPMs with, you know, the Hulu's, the Peacocks of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense because like, that's how we, I understand premium, right? Like it's not only a private deal at this point. It's mm -hmm. like, how do I make sure that it's as specialized as possible? And yeah. I love what you said about like going direct to those partners and activating a true partnership or activating some type of deal because mm -hmm. then, you know, okay, well, I it's it's to me it's catered to me it's curated is the word right it's a curated yeah. creation to my needs or to at least my advertisers needs and so it, along with that what is the amount of partners that what's like you have 25 of them do you have a good select of five that you tap into 
automatically or do you have like a, oh we have three just for pharma and we have two for i don't know cpg or whatever so what's the right amount of create to of, of those direct partners that you're referring to whether it's oem partners whether it's say like something else i would say and this is not the best answer but it's the truth it's not a one size fits all um i'm not going to stick you know five partners on every single plan or 10 partners on every single plan it's obviously going to be very dictated by budget and what the really main goal of the campaign is mm -hmm. uh, and i think a lot of times because we have access to all these partners and this is sort of getting into some of the best practices too of like yeah. um because we have access to all these great partners out there it's like oh like well we we're, we're super targeted we have like our audience like that we want to hit like let's reach them anywhere but like we know the space is so fragmented and so yeah is it better to hit someone you know at a really healthy frequency on one app continuously over a month, or do we want to reach them everywhere, no matter where they're viewing? And there's challenges with both. Um, there's pros and cons, I would say. Um, I I try to like guide my team in saying like let's not let's not overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get to a really healthy reach and frequency on a few like a handful of partners, and if we feel like we can expand and still get some incremental value out of adding another partner to the plan, great. Um, we've been doing a lot of measurement um on trying to understand where the duplication is across partners and if there's unique reach in across these partners and we're still reaching a healthy reach and frequency then great let's add more partners to the plan let's reach these people wherever they are consuming content um but of course i mean it's it's just going to depend on the client and the geo that you're in is it a one market campaign or is it a national campaign what does the budget look like um how targeted is it Mm -hmm. um, are we trying to reach everyone or is it a hyper, hyper targeted campaign? And so I think all those factors play a, play a role. Um, and also understanding like where can these people be reached? So like doing the research of understanding, like, you know, if you have a target audience, um, where do they index highs for? Are they on Peacock? Are they more just like watching that linear, like viewing within the OEM? So doing yeah. some of that consumption research too, to really guide your plan. And then I think you can start to say, okay, you know, we can, we can have a healthy reach and frequency across four partners, or, um, uh, maybe we can have six, but, um, kind of teetering. And that's where the trader's job is so important is, you yeah. know, making those observations and testing. And, you know, if, you see some negative impact for a few weeks. I think that's a good learning. I think we're so scared to like, you know, make performance like uh, go on like a downward trend, but like you still learn something and then, you know, you can revert back and try something new um, after the fact. No, I agree with you. I know for a fact that our greatest learnings come in failures, not in wins. Okay. Mm -hmm. People may argue otherwise, but I think that, and we don't want to encourage like go maybe we want to encourage like fail fast right fail fail first and fail fast so that you can learn and implement mm -hmm. and now failing could mean a lot of things right and, I, and i'm going on attention here but i really want to encourage everyone to keep testing and not be afraid of failing because i i, I know for a fact that teams that we train and i'll take like 30 seconds to explain to the listening here what we do is that we work closely with ad agencies agency trading desks brands in-house and programmatic. Um, now, very recently, like SSPs and ad techs are hiring us to train their team, right? What is, what does it take for a trader or a buyer to make this decision? How can we make sure that our deal are prioritized or inventory are prioritized, things like that. And so I talked to a lot of buyers and ad ops and sellers, and they're all down to we want to be careful with how we're implementing things because, you know, we don't want to lose this opportunity. But at the end of the day, I feel like if you don't have the courage to test things that are going to feel scary or feel different or see the numbers going in red first versus like where you want it to be, I feel like that's the the authenticity that we're missing in some of those partnerships. It's like we're not we're, we're scared of doing this because then budget is going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, like on the buyer side on the agency or the brand side is like oh if if a partner give the partner a second a second chance right like this but you could easily see and I, i'm going to refer to what you said is that when you have those strategy implemented with those specific partners and then they start failing your trader can start seeing the sign fairly early and they can start mm -hmm. assessing like oh in the first week or so this is this ain't working let's try oh it's still not working well let's pivot completely after week two issue yeah. right so in the first three weeks 
you can help the partner make different definition and optimize and give the partner those feedback because they're supposed to do it on their own as well. Like put them to work, but you need to give them strategic and tactical insight to help them help us. Because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? But at least you've tried. So don't be afraid of, like just have that courage to try with those partners and give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, of the doubt on things and give them second, third chances because they can't perform fairly well if they're given a chance. I mean, I mean, some partners just sucks, but does it suck because it's not performing or does it suck before the inventory is not there, which leads into underperformance, things like that. So in recap of some of the best practices, I heard you say quite a few things, right? And so I'm going to try to recap what you said because there are a lot of gems. Um, to correct me if I'm wrong. So have strategic partners aligned with your strategy. Strategy means KPIs, goal, targeting, which include audiences and then messaging. I heard you talk mm-hmm. a lot about messaging, y'all. Listen to Haley, messaging is just as important as all of the other four. I mean, three mentioned. So align those partners with them. I also heard you say quite a few times, and I think if we were playing a drinking game, that would be the drinking word is that, well, words is that not all size fit? <laughs> is I don't just assume that, you know, Tebow is going to work with everybody. It's probably mm-hmm. not. And so make sure you track these performance. Make sure you start your own. You've Some of the listeners have referred me say to this. I mean, refer to, to, to this as like SPO toolbox. Like make sure you open your toolbox of suppliers and say, okay, this supplier, we tested at X amount of budget and it worked really well for this about this audiences, but not for this one. Right. Mm -hmm. Keep track of those suppliers. Like, I feel like this is exactly what Haley has brought into us is that, yeah, you can have as many OEM partners as you want, but like, remember that these specific one works well here and there. And that's part of what we're supposed to do anyway, right? Like provide, you have to be reactive at some point, which is part of the optimization, right? Right. The campaign is launched, but I am going to encourage everyone listening to be proactive. It's like start reaching out to those partners before you even start meeting them because most likely you already needed them, but you didn't know. And so just, just talk to them and always ask what's under the hood. Like, how is your audience build? package mm-hmm. what makes sense do we have leverage over the cpms do we have leverage over the audience and things like that and allow them to do their stuff like if a partner comes back if in mobi comes back and say we're going to implement brand safety on the back end like allow them to do that and yeah. test like because like dsps and and ssps don't always communicate the same language and so that hinders our performance a lot because we want to add all of those filters in our dsp because we're supposed to, right? Mm-hmm. But then if it's a direct or curated deal or something that was discussed outside of the DSP, then allow them to do their magic. That's how you maximize the the stuff. Absolutely. And I think too, especially with a medium that has such a high CPM, like Connected TV, allowing the publishers yes. to apply as much as possible on their end, targeting brand safety, anything under the sun that they can, um, I'd say take advantage of that um, when you are having those conversations, because it'll just help the overall overall buy, um, keeping some of those costs down that come out of the DSP. Yeah. And that's an excellent point is that it's almost like a la carte, right? It's like a la carte uh, mm-hmm. uh, pricing. It's like if you add all those, those brand safeties, like boom, 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 those CPM rise up even more. And that's why some of the inventory ain't really there, right? Yeah. But if you remove all those brain safety, it's going to feel super unnatural. It's going to feel scary because as a trader mm-hmm. myself, it's like, mm, why you don't want me to add IAS again? But at the end of the day, it's like if they have it on their end and it's one mm-hmm. price, and like you said, it's super cost effective for everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges that when an ad tech or like on the sell side, when they hire us, like when a publisher hire us to, to understand um, the decision making, it's it's their biggest um, challenges is to go back and discuss with the trader, like, yo, remove some of those filters that are, you know, hurting our inventory more than it's helping, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and obviously if you're listening, you're like, wow, that sounds scary. Like how would we know if it's actually performing, you know, you're, you're, 
you're tracking this. You can pull a report and see, is this for real, is it not for real? And then make decision faster, right? That's the whole point of what Haley was saying. You got to go back and check on your work. Absolutely. For sure. Okay, so one last question before we go into our closing segment is that I'd like to ask you if there's two, maybe three things you definitely want them to implement when it comes to CTV, OTT best practices, when it comes to deciding on your premium partners, when it comes to how to reach out to those partners, what is three things you want everyone to do today or maybe remember to do? Um, I think quickly going back to what we were kind of just saying of like relying on the publishers, um, I would say, the more layers, um, especially when it comes to targeting, the more expensive it becomes. Um, I think, you know, we get really excited because it is running in a DSP and we have all of the great third party data and first party data contextual at our fingertips. Um, but I'd say don't overcomplicate it. Um, rely on the publisher data. They have a treasure trove of first party data themselves. And so if we can find them in that way without having to, you know, add six layers of and statements in the DSP. Um, I can almost guarantee it'll probably perform better, but don't take my word for it. Test it. Like I would say that's like the second thing is like continue to test, um, test different partners, lean into OEMs, lean into those premium partners, um, test it against some of the run of network deals in the, in the DSPs that we have access to and see what works well. And I think like we were saying earlier on, no two plans are going to be the same. And so it's not going to be like a cookie cutter plan across all, all of your clients and campaigns, markets, anything like that. Really understand like what works well for this, for this brand, for this market um, and make sure you're taking notes of those things, because obviously um, having that data trended over time will help you in the long run, save sure. you time in the future. Um, and then last thing I think is, um, really at, at least from, from like my experience, we get, we get a lot of clients, um, who are like, well, the CPM is really high and why is our cost per lead so high okay. on CTV? And it's like, if we held CTV to the same degree as some of our lower funnel tactics, like yeah. retargeting and paid search and things like that, it's never going to look as, look as good. Um, and I think it, it's almost funny to me is like on the linear side, we don't hold it to the same like 10th degree. Um, so I'd say obviously in a respectful way, put like push back a little bit. It is, it's an upper funnel channel. We have to build that top of funnel awareness um, to make our lower funnel channels perform better. It all works together like cohesively. Um, yeah. And so keeping that in mind, I think, especially as a trader, when you see high cost pers in the platform against CTV, you're like quick to cut it and shift budget to maybe display or retargeting or whatever it might be, uh, but it is doing, it's doing its job. Yeah. Um, we know it's a very high, like highly engaging, leaned in environment, and it's going to be all viewed through conversion. So we're not going to see the immediate impact. Um, but I would say set up some other guardrails in place, even if your main KPI is a purchase or a lead form or some, or one of something of that nature, set up some other conversion tracking. So are mm -hmm. we seeing a lift to site traffic? Are we seeing more engagement on a certain blog post or something like that? Um, mm -hmm. You have other indicators that you can say, CTV is working, push people down the funnel um, mm -hmm. and bring those insights to clients. You know, if if we're not able to show them a really healthy cost per purchase or something yeah. of that nature, what can you show them? Um, because at the end of the day, every client brand is going to want some indicator that their dollars are working for them. So what can you show them as a proof point um, to really like show and prove out that CTV is an important part of their media mix? That's like, I couldn't have ended this podcast any better than this, y'all. It's It was super, and, and you're absolutely right, going back really quick to the number one of uh, allowing them to do what they're supposed to do, right? And trusting the publisher. Like I remember specifically testing on like Pandora way, way back when, and then Pandora pushed us back saying, listen, I know you want to add all those filters, but let us do it. Let's do it. We didn't listen, barely perform after a month, barely spend actually. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to shift it to, I don't know, something else. And then they got, came back, pushed back and said, no, you did not listen diplomatically, obviously, because we were <laughs> the, the client. <laughs> and so we ended up continuing. So we ended up testing two things uh, within that budget. It's like a deal that they control audience 
and all of the above, right? Including geo. And so in our, in our DSP it looked like a run of exchange, but it wasn't for real. Mm -hmm. um, then the second one was still the same deal, but we, we lifted up some brain safety. We opened up the geo a little bit. And so this, this first one where we had more control over targeting, spend a little bit more, but not as much as we didn't see the, the result that we wanted versus the actual deal that we allow them to curate, to control everything else. We saw a lift instantly. Mm -hmm. like we started spending, um, and then we, I think, it was for uh, a university. Was it for EDU? Or was it for this former brand? I can't remember. Uh, but we instantly saw some conversion happen. And conversion for for you know EDU is is an application, but most of the EDU don't have applications. So we just we just we just uh, page view. You know, like a page mm -hmm. view on the actual landing page um uh, but um uh, but thank you so much for sharing this because i've been spending a lot of time with publishers and they're all begging the same thing like we want to reach out directly to some of these companies some agencies and help them out we are able to help out we are not all mfas and i, and I believe that as well it's like it's, mm -hmm. go back to that definition right like is it defined is it checking this box or not um so I encourage anybody on the call to just practice what um, Haley is preaching and practicing on her own. It's like to establish those direct partnership, but also allow them to do their magic. And it's less work for you anyway. It's like, you're more efficient in our work. Okay, so one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, if you had to leave us with a word of wisdom, right? If you had to share something you wish you knew when you first started in the industry as a freshman in programmatic and ad tech, Mm -hmm. um, what is something you wish you knew then that you now know? Mm. Could be one thing. Yeah. I would say just to continue to stay curious. Um, mm -hmm. I think I have always been this way. And yeah. <laughs> even like when I was starting out my career, um, didn't really know what I was asking, but I was asking questions and I would say, just keep poking holes and asking the questions. Um, just because something is done one way does not mean it's the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really the only way plans evolve and, you know, you develop new tests and findings come to life. And I, yeah, I would say stay curious. I think that's something that I've like always carried with me and continue to do every day is poke holes in things and ask, ask questions. And no, no question is a bad question. Um, that is so good. That's so good. Stay curious is something I've always also preached for. And then recently I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book from David Novak and we can end with this. It's called how, how leaders learn. And mm -hmm. he's redefining active learning for me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what staying curious is. It's the way an active learner is that you're not afraid of asking the questions, whether it's hard or not. Yeah. And you're not afraid to implementing and trying new things or receiving when you need to receive. So thank you, Haley, for dropping thank by. Thank you. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to you um, for any anything, how can they do that? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Haley Wise, uh, W-I-A-Z. Um, happy, happy to connect. Um, yeah. And Haley's information will all be in the show notes of the podcast and on YouTube in the video description. Haley, thank you so much for dropping by. We appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much.